A Musical Life with organist Hector Oliveira. Hector Oliveira was a child prodigy on the organ, having performed for the likes of Eva Perón, the first lady of Argentina, when he was only five. Hector has since become an international sensation, performing in all the great cathedral organs around the world, as well as embracing the possibilities of digital organs with his stunning live performances of classical as well as popular and movie transcriptions. What does it take to win an audition? What are the secrets behind those musicians who have won orchestra jobs and prominent teaching positions? Jason Heath, host of the popular Contrabass Conversations podcast, has just written a new book, Winning the Audition, where he sits down with 27 successful audition winners and finds out what they did to prepare and win. This Thursday, November 17th, at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will be co-hosting a webinar with Jason to explore what it takes to win an audition. To sign up for this free webinar, go to amusicallife.com forward slash audition. Once again, that web address is amusicallife.com forward slash audition. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. The mighty pipe organ has been hailed as the king of instruments with its ability to reproduce the sounds of entire orchestras and actually has been in existence since the time of the ancient Greeks. Throughout its history, the organ represented the cutting edge of technological and musical capabilities. It's rather curious that in recent times, with the advent of digital organ technologies that simulate the massive pipe structures and add more sound and performance capabilities, there has been quite a bit of resistance from traditional organists to embrace these newer, smaller instruments. Hector Oliveira is a remarkable musician who freely embraces both traditional and digital perspectives, and his performances leave you wondering, how is it possible that one person could play all those instrument sounds all at once? Let's listen to his arrangement of one of Astor Piazzolla's most famous tangos, Oblivion.
Hector, welcome to the show. It's so lovely to have you. Well, thank you for having me. We just had a lovely lunch, and you were telling me some amazing stories of your childhood. <laughs> we just heard your beautiful rendition of, of Oblivion by, uh, by Piazzolla, and you apparently had actually met Piazzolla. Tell me about that story. Yes, um, I sat on his knees when I was seven years old, about <laughs> seven, eight years old, and apparently... He, according to the recollections of my own parents, uh, I, he gave me a little theme and I improvised. Um, when you were seven years was, old, yeah, yes. you improvised the theme that he gave you? Yes. Oh my goodness. And uh, I, I remember him hugging me at the very ending and uh, kind of scratched my face with his big mustache <laughs> than he had. But uh, he was such a nice, warm person. Wow. Very warm person. I could tell even, at, even though I was seven or eight years old. We were also talking a little bit about Piazzolo, and you had a wonderful allusion to what he did for the tango, being very similar to what Chopin did. Yeah, I, 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 I always think that um, the art, but as you know, it took decades for Argentinians to actually accept what Piazzolo was doing. He was more triumphant already in Paris and in New York City than he was in other Spanish-speaking countries like, like Cuba, for an instance. Um, in those days, he was doing tours, and they were not going very well because the people couldn't understand what is it, what he was trying to do. But uh, uh, he, uh, I always thought that uh, Piazzolla did for the tango what Chopin did for the waltz uh, in Poland, you know. Mm. And uh, that's always been, uh, of course, the elegant uh, way that he wrote his, his melodies, uh, uh, and of course. My biggest idol in music-wise is definitely Johann Sebastian Bach. So I, I turn to gravitate immediately to anybody that is starting to do that sort of things. And uh, Oblivion, for an instance, such a gorgeous melody almost can be compared to the air uh, from Suite Number no. 3 of Bach, you know, mm. that kind of thing. Yeah. So I want to delve a little bit into your remarkable childhood. I understand that you were only three years old when you started to learn to play the organ from your father, and two years later you were appointed organist of the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Argentina. At that age, how did you even reach the foot pedal? I didn't, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> no, my father very, I, I, I seem to remember my father pressing occasional notes in the pedals. I would just play the, the hands, and he had made transcriptions of famous pieces for me to play, harmonium style, which is, you know, the left hand, that's the bass and the chords and the right hand as a melody. Uh, very harmonium style of playing. And I remember already doing the Largo from Xerxes of, of Handel and the A and the G string of uh, from Suite Number 3 of Bach. It was a couple of fugues that I did for, from the Clavier little book of Bach. And um, an improvisation. That was the thing that uh, I remember way back in those days. It's funny that you should ask why, because Nobody knows too much the details, but uh, why I became organist is a very funny story. That uh, I was playing the air on the uh, from suite number three. I call it the air on the G string of Bach, and uh, some part of the mass uh, when I was doing that. And there was a young couple that were getting married the following Saturday, and they asked the father that piece that the organist played for the communion. We would like to hear that. For the, way, for the ring ceremony, instead of the Ave Maria and so forth. So the, preach, the, the father told my father, well, you know, that's what they want to hear. And he says, I can't play that. He says, what do you mean you just played it? He says, well, it was not me, actually, it was my son. He says, well, I don't care who plays it, just if somebody <laughs> plays that, that's what the couple wants. Oh, okay, so my father took it very hard. <laughs> and he said, okay, now you are the organist. <laughs> but actually, he continued playing, obviously, for the weddings, because I couldn't, I didn't have the repertoire. I was just five years old when, you know, I came play at the wedding marches. Unbelievable. So, again, going on with some more amazing tales, not only <laughs> you started at such a young age, but I'm told by a reliable source that you actually performed 
for Eva Perón, the first lady of Argentina, famously known as Evita, Evita. when you were only four years old. Now, what did you play? What was her reaction? Uh, yeah, actually, it was more like it thought, uh, more five at that time okay, because so, I was already the oh, oh, old You were an old man by then. I was an old man. <laughs> you played for Evita. <laughs> what, was her re- what did you play for her? And what, how did she react? Well, because I was already playing these masses and uh, she loved children. And, uh, and uh, my father saw that there was a mass where everybody in Argentina was praying for her health. And this mass was in this church. And we didn't know that she was going to be there in person. She, she kept hopping from church to church. Uh, and uh, she was there that, that day. It was a miracle, really. I, uh, I came down with my father on the spiral staircase. And, and uh, she approached with a whole bunch of people, okay, security people. And uh, Lynn Fogler gave me a kiss. I, I never forgot that. I, even though I couldn't remember who that person was. <laughs> I, yes, just an, a, a lady that kissed me. But then my father told me two, three years later, I remember that person, that was Eva Peron. Ooh. And she actually, as it is, very sad, she passed five months after that. She was very, very ill. Yeah. amazing. I feel like I'm talking to a living Mozart, you know, pl- <laughs> no, no, playing, no, no, for, no. playing for royalty, meeting these famous people, and doing these remarkable things at such a young age. Now, I understand that you were only nine years old when you composed a suite for oboe and string orchestra, which was then performed by the Buenos Aires Symphony Orchestra. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, of course, because I was studying harmony, counterpoint, fugue, yeah. and so it was an exercise to write this prelude, chorale, and fugue. And um, uh, my teacher said, what would you want to write it for? Uh, I was so much into Bach and the Brandenburg Concerto, so I thought, oh, strings, you know, th- that's, that's what I knew, yeah. the strings. Yeah. So he says, okay, so he says, no solos, uh, oboe. I don't know what made me say <laughs> oboe, so he says, okay, let's do, do something for the oboe. So I wrote this prelude in the G minor, 
the choral was in C and the few went back into G. And obviously, I was at nine years old. He helped me very much into the orchestration uh, of that because, sure. you know, I mean, I, let's face it, okay? But even so, that's But uh, yeah, I actually did copy the parts. And then, of course, my father was the one who actually was in charge of duplicating the parts for the violins and the violas and so forth. Oh, wow. and, uh, and I remember, I, I, I still have pictures of me with the short pants <laughs> and um, saying thank you to the audience. So, because I was there, you know, during the first performance. My goodness. Okay, so if, if this wasn't enough, at the ripe old age of 17, I understand you became the head of the organ department. Where, where, where were you be? I was in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, that, that, that only lasted six months because at that time I was already coming in into the United States of I America. See. I see. Um, and uh, yeah, it was an interesting thing to, to talk to about people that were, you know, so much, much older than me. And uh, now I take it into like, did that really happen? Yes, it did. Uh, how could that happen? I don't know, but it did happen. That's all I know. <laughs> um, that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, it, it was at that time that with my teacher, he suggested that I come to the United States to study in Juilliard School of Music because he had studied himself. Oh, uh -huh. And so I came to Juilliard uh, when I was 18, you know, in 1965. Now, you've mentioned your hero, Johannes Sebastian Bach, who, of course, himself was very famous for improvising at the organ. And you're known for being an incredible improviser yourself. Wow. In fact, I believe in 1968, you won the National Improvisation Contest sponsored by the American Guild of Organists, which in that event helped to launch your professional career. I'm wondering if you could help us understand the improvisational pro mindset. Process. Yeah, process. You know, I'm wondering, part of it is, of course, you have access to so many different sounds and so many right. different colors. I'm wondering if that... You know, do you think of the melody first? Do you think of the structure first, the rhythm? What 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 comes into your mind when you're improvising something? It changes, of course, with the theme. Um, I always illustrated, and I learned this from the great improviser Pierre Cochero. Then, um, you know, some people can improvise uh, with because they have the technical abilities at the piano, uh, and it's like a string of notes from beginning to to ending based on a theme. Yeah, it, that's, that's great. To me, the structure of our improvisation is pretty much based upon, you know, talking about, ladies and gentlemen, here we are to introduce you to the entry level of a BMW cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, these cars, even on the entry level, comes with leather seats. And then you blah, 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 blah. In the middle of it, you talk about Maybe the Mercedes-Benz, yeah, well, also has very rich leathers and the engine, blah, blah, blah. But you have to finish your conversation the way you started, because otherwise you start talking about senseless. And the point was talking about the leather seats of the entry level of BMW. You have to finish improvisation to remind them that don't forget that BMW does have leather seats uh, in the entry level of, of the models. So to me, that has a structure. Uh, many people, like I say, improvise and they just go on and on and on and on and on. Sure. And I probably did that myself very often in my younger days. Now I'm starting to think this is more like a three-part, like a sonata. And uh, you, have to, you have to come back. And so it is not that simple to improvise and remember what you did five minutes ago to come back to. Because you're obviously going to put your own melodies besides the melody yeah. of the thing that you're improvising. Well, please try to remember what you did on the first 16 bars because you really need to come back so the listener can hear the structure of it. It's just like listening to a Bach uh, prelude or a Mozart sonata, you know. Yeah, and it's interesting that you compare this to having a conversation. Just, yeah. just like we improvise as we talk. Right. Music is very similar, and yet even within the conversation, you have to have a return. Yeah, to the you have to have a, st a structure of a return 
because otherwise we can keep talking and talking and talking and, and it does happen and then a conversation we could detract it and keep talking about other cars and other brands and then talking about transmission and this and that and suddenly what we were talking about did that even happen to you to people what we were talking about yes. because you get lost so what we were talking yeah but you were mentioning about the letter C. oh yeah that's right so, <laughs> that's a fantastic way to help us understand thank you so much you're for, very welcome for sharing that now we were talking a little bit while we were having lunch about the remarkable ways that you're able to make certain pieces sound impossible like that one person is doing all those things. And I know there's a great deal of controversy in, with, among organists, you know, with the traditional pipe organs. And of course, now we have access to these amazing digital instruments. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit, because you're comfortable with, obviously, with both. Yeah. It... <clears throat> Again, we were talking about a lot of organisms nowadays uh, tend to uh, gravitate towards the transcription. So you can hear so and so famous organist playing not only Bach and Cecil Frank, but probably taking a transcription of, uh, I don't know, Das Macabre of San San, or the Maestoso from the Symphony Number no. 3, uh, Firebird Suite, or whatever. And, um, and they do an extremely good job of that at the pipe organ. I kind of save the pipe organ personally myself for just straight literature. And then in the digital electronic organ is where I do my transcriptions and uh, uh, like Firebird Suite or Dance Macabre or Bolero Ravel, whatever. love to do movie themes too because mm. people are very I love the orchestral sounds like to me the symphony orchestra that's it uh, when I tell people that I play this electronic organ they always think about do you play jazz you know gospel <laughs> no I uh, I dabble a little bit but that's not my thing my thing is to do recreate the symphony orchestra sound and recreate it live that is the key live and that is where we part into many situations where some of my closest uh, friends that are really musicians having problem understanding that I did that live and I have to show them today or look, look, see what I'm doing. Because obviously in the digital organ you can split keyboards, you can do things, you can do that. And uh, even the pipe organ could not do that yeah. uh, to a certain degree. There are some more modern pipe organs nowadays like Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris that has sustained, so you can play a chord in one manual and then sustain it with your foot and keep moving with your hands to other manuals and so forth. So yes, there is possibility in some of the modernistic or the modernist size pipe organ, but still not, no venue like the, because the pipes cannot have velocity like a piano. Yeah. The pipes is like a, like a chamber, mm -hmm. you know, so that's it, that's all you get. You want to change it, you change the keyboards in a chamber or you add a four foot or you put a lute 
you know, uh, but uh, in the pipe organ, that's it, a principle is a principle. You cannot make it sound louder by pounding the keys. But in an electronic organ, you can take a brass and simulate what happens with the tonguing of a trumpet or a French horn, whatever. I, mean, I think, uh, again, speaking as a layperson, I would think that being able to recreate the sounds of the orchestra as an orchestra actually sounds, not as a pipe recreation, right. would, would be something extremely exciting. I'm wondering why organists are so resistant to mm. taking advantage of this amazing te these amazing technologies. Why do you think there's so much resistance to that? I honestly don't know. Part of it is probably because when they see the kind of electronic instrument that I play, which is relatively small, which is two manuals and a short pedal board of 25 notes, they immediately see that like, oh, that's just like, like a Hammond organ. And no disrespect to the Hammond organ, but sure. the Hammond organ cannot do what I do sure. with my music machine. Yeah. And, uh, and this uh, instrument allows me to do all of these things in real time. Um, if if I would have a chance to perhaps sit with them for two or three hours, maybe I can change their mind. But I, to be honest with you, I really doubt it mm. because they are. I know. So I just played a concert on a big digital organ in West Virginia, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, digital pipe mm. emulation mm. Uh, electronic organ ever built, and. Um, I, I was I was told during dinner time that one a famous organist which I'm not going to mention from Europe refused to come in to play a concert because they just won't play an electronic organ. Really? Yeah, and the organ wasn't fully electronic. It had quite a few ranks of pipes. So, but the person. So I guess there are those people. Oh, sorry, the money wasn't the problem. How much you pay me? It's just that no, I will not sit if it has electronic uh, digital. So I don't. Hmm. Uh, can I can I interject something myself? Absolutely. I think it it comes down to making music. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I I have claimed forever that you can play Bach in an accordion. Yeah. Yeah. How many times I have been to Europe and Italy, France, and have heard somebody with an accordion or a French musette playing a Bach, a Prelude and Fugue? Or it's possible. Yeah. Uh, I always say that if I was in an island all by myself and I could construct with a cigar box of some sort of a device that has some sort of a resonance and put some rubber bands and just get five notes out of that, you know, just make music that way, I would be fairly pleased. I mm. don't have to have the largest pipe organ in the world. Some people get lost in the mechanics yeah. of what makes music. Mm. I am interested in making music. Period. Yeah, no, and using whatever tools you have. Right. Yeah, it's, it, and hopefully more musicians will become more open-minded. Hopefully. About uh, hopefully, being hopefully. more creative about the tools they use. Speaking of more traditional organs, you performed on, on so many wonderful organs around the world. I understand that the great organ in the Notre Dame Cathedral yeah. in Paris, which you just mentioned, 
it's been performed since 1334 and was completely restored, I believe, in 1992. And I understand you played in the rededic rededication of that historic organ. I mean, what was it like playing that? It is, a, it is a trip. Well, first of all, the, the instrument itself, it's uh, like no other instrument in the world. I was very honored to play a concert, to be invited to play a concert in there. I, that was my second concert. My first concert was in 1985, and the organ was in very deplorable state mm. condition. Mm. Pierre Cochero had just died, and with people helping to the stops. But it was, you know, I, I punched my way out of a paper bag, but uh, not like the second time. And then I went and played this instrument, and. Uh, Oh, it's it's a real trip, and let me tell you, it's not just the organ. It's just to be at that cathedral, and when mm. you are rehearsing at two o'clock in the morning, and you can see dimly lit those candles yeah. downstairs, two blocks away from you, and you looked at that uh, altar, and you see uh, that big throne in there, and you think about the the, the uh, Napoleon being in there. Yeah. Uh, it's that's reality, you know, it's that we, we could talk about the Hunchback of Notre Dame, that was a great book, okay, yeah, yeah. like Julius Verne and yeah, the 20,000 yeah. Ladies Under the Sea, but uh, uh, when, you, when you are in that cathedral and you think about the, uh, uh, Napoleon, you know that, that this, this is real, this really happened, and you suddenly are in, in that tribune, as they call it, in, the, in Europe playing that magnificent instrument has been in there for so long. Yeah. And all the great organists that have played it, including Louis Vierne, and, uh, who was the organist in there. It's an if, and you can't explain it. You, can't ex you mm. have to leave it. Mm. Now, I understand that you also played the final organ concert at the, C the Crystal Cathedral, which unfortunately went bankrupt in 2010, was sold to the Roman Catholic Diocese of Orange in 2012. I understand that the Hazel Wright Memorial Organ there is one of the largest musical instruments in the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just want, curious, the, the acoustics in this, the largest glass building in the world <laughs> must be quite spectacular. I wonder if you could tell me what... Yeah, it's, it's, it's of course, it's quite a reverberant place, even though in the days that I did that, there was still carpeting and there was still soft cushions I all see. over the, the pews, yeah. but still was... Yeah. Extremely reverent. You should hear it now. They took off everything, oh. and that organ is going to be unbelievable when it comes back. Uh, I um, I performed the I can't remember the complete program right now, but the big thing was uh, the Symphony Number no. Six of Louis Vuitton. I mean, excuse me, Vidor. Uh, okay. Symphony Number no. Six, and um, I actually, if I may say this in a jokingly way, the concert was to show everybody that the organ was not in very good shape and we need to, to do this. So, you know, this is what we collect in money. Ah. Unfortunately, I worked so hard for three days to try to work around the, the, the holes that the organ had. Then it sounded pretty decent. Oh, no. <laughs> was, you succeeded too well. Yeah, <laughs> was some, you were supposed to fail, right? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, there were some people wondering, why do we need to repair it? It, it sounds sounds good so to good. Me. <laughs> That's... That is funny. <laughs> well, we've talked about a couple of organs. I I'm wondering, in all your travels around the world, are there any other... Because every organ is so different and yeah. unique to yeah. each space. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm wondering if there are any special organs in particular spaces that are especially memorable. That so, so is, so is in Paris, of course, as being... A, one of the very few organs around the world that is still historically conserved uh, the way it was originally. Uh, Notre Dame is a magnificent organ, but it has been modernized with, and so much, and the sound has been changed. We don't know exactly what was it like in 1850, but Saint-Sulpice, uh, that's as originally as he's going to get for right now. Uh, for, I don't know, Berlin Cathedral, mm. the, the uh, Berlin Dome. Uh, I love that place, and the acoustic, the reverb in that church, Liverpool Cathedral in, in, in England. Um, and well, you know, I'm not wanting to gravitate just in, in, in the United States. Uh, I just played two years ago a concert in the, uh, Hong Kong, actually, in the, oh, uh, really? the, festi the festival, and um, it was a big five manual rigor pipe organ, and I actually went to Shenzhen to play another big rigor. And, uh, they were magnificent organs. Actually, I'm really 
hoping that someday I can get back to Hong Kong and play a concert in that festival hall because it was an unbelievable sounding instrument. Wow. And, you know, United States of America, St. John the Divine and Washington Cathedral. And, uh, and you know, uh, hopefully I will be able to get my hands again on that organ at the Christ Cathedral, which is, that's, that's how it's called now. Wow. Uh, when the organ comes back and uh, to be re-inaugurated by a cycle of concerts, and I hope they, I'm one of those persons that, uh, so they say, but let's, let's wait and see. Because I love to hear what that organ is going to sound now that they took all the carpeting and all the, the, the intentions is to make it full of people and it still have a good four seconds of reverb. That ah. is, they always, that's what they, they are aiming for. Is that, the, the, is that a good standard for a space? It, it, yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's four seconds, three seconds or five, but, yeah, it is nothing like playing an organ and when you lift the core, it rings. Just rings. Because many of the compositions, especially on the French literature, were written to play along with the acoustics. Ah. You know, you see these chords with staccato markings yes. or sometimes they even, it's an eighth note uh, uh, with, you know, with the rest and the quarter note to the next, the third beat. And these chords twice per, per you know, in a common, uh, metric uh, those and what you wonder why is the organist has in mind well obviously he's playing with that reverb and pow, mm. pow and it cannot be done when you go to a, a church that is all carpeted and heavy draped mm. it just doesn't quite make it you know now it's funny because I I gave some performances in Prague many many years ago and I had some friends sneak me up to the Prague Cathedral to meet the organist, and he actually let me play around on that magnificent organ. Have you played the, the organ? Yes, the yes. Uh, wow. Not never for uh, in a formal concert, just for fun. Yeah, Prague, and um, there is a big organ also in the in, in the Budapest, which I also enjoyed it getting my hands. Uh, concert halls. You know, you know, I'm just about to perform right now at Kimo uh, Center, and I really love this instrument because. Mm. This python is in a wooden uh, a concert hall. It does have that little bit of ringing when you quit on the chorus, yeah. not dead, 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 dead completely. Yeah. And I, I enjoy very much playing this instrument. Another one is in Seeger's drums and, uh, uh, in, in California, in Costa Mesa, uh, face organ, also that has a ring. But the acoustics of the concert hall are made such that you can make it resonate a little bit or you can dampen in case that you have a jazz concert or something like that. You can change it by moving some walls and some yes. carpet. I don't know how it's done, but uh, uh, basically you can make it resonate. You can make it ring or dead uh, for a jazz concert, you know. Uh, I enjoy playing this concert. Again, nothing like going to a good old church build on stone with marble floors and you play that chord and you, ah. <laughs> well if we can go on the opposite end of the spectrum we talked about some magnificent instruments historic instruments well what about some of the modern instruments the electronic organs would you mind maybe sharing some of your favorite models what no you uh, they are, well there has been there are many 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 different uh, uh models and brands nowadays um i have worked uh, very extensively uh, for Dragos uh, Organ Company. Uh, I am currently also involved with the island people, and uh, I have played it. Johannes and, and, and Viscount. I have played in many organs, and they all have something to offer. A lot of people sit in there and and they ask, "How can you do this? Uh, don't you mess this out of this particular brand?" No, because you know what? To me, it's another organ. Mm -hmm. It's a pipe organ. It's like. If I'm playing, I don't know, Central Baptist Church in Charlotte, I don't even know if there is such a thing, but I'm just saying a church. And it's dead like a doornail type of thing, you know, with, with carpeting and so forth, typical. Uh, and then I move to, you know, Washington Cathedral, and you have seven seconds of reverb, or the National Shrine in Washington, you know, that's unbelievable, 11 seconds or something like oh, that wow. of reverb. Well, don't you miss the clarity of the other place? No. Or when I'm playing at the Baptist Church, don't you miss the reverb? Yes, I do. But you just adjust and play and make that organ sound the best. You know, I mean, Notre Dame doesn't sound like uh, Saint-Sulpice. Saint-Sulpice doesn't sound like, like uh, 
a, a, a Berlin Cathedral. Berlin Cathedral doesn't sound like Liverpool. They're all different pipe organs, uh, and each one you treat it differently. The electronic organs, each one I treat it for what they have to offer and make the best of my ability music in those machines. You know, if I'm hearing you correctly, <coughs> this is something I really admire because I know of musicians that are very purist and they'll say, well, you know, this piano is not like that piano. This hall is not like that hall. But you sound like the kind of musician that no matter where you are, no matter what instrument you're playing, you find the best qualities in them and you enjoy what you're offered, what you yes. what you're working. <coughs> yes, I do. And, uh, and it, this is, again, it goes back to the art of making music, not just try to make the organ. I have known organists that have criticized not being able to do what they want because the organ wouldn't do what they wanted to do. Mm. Sometimes you do what the organ wants to do, <laughs> not what you want the organ to do. Yeah. Uh, you, we were just talking about uh, <coughs> the art of making music in the instrument. I have, I have keyboards, they have been standard for the last century, 61 notes, 32 notes per album. You make music with that. Bach did it, Fjorn, Vidor, uh, Marcel Dupre, Messiaen, whatever. And you can do that uh, just as well uh, with a smaller instrument too. Imagine this, and uh, I'm gonna take you out of the organ right now. Imagine that just because Yo-Yo Ma wanted to set something different, then he was to get a cello that had seven strings. And now he's playing, he has strings in there that he can make that sound like a true violin. So what's the big deal? He's playing a cello. I want to hear a cello. If I go to hear Yo-Yo Ma, I want to hear what he's going to do and get the most out of that cello. If I want to hear a, a violin, I go hear Isaac Perlman. I, I don't know if, I, if I'm trying to come across to what I'm trying to do. So some people are trying to do with the pipe organ and the electronic organ what the instrument really is not supposed to be doing. And just for the sake of uh, doing it, I, probably we're trying to get away from the music. Mm. Uh, I'd rather hear Yo-Yo Ma playing Oblivion mm. on the cello and just g e embrace that magnificent sound he's going to do. Not hear him making the organ sound like an accordion. I, I see. If I want to hear Oblivion and an accordion, then I go to another concert. You, mm. you follow me? I think that, so. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, there are many things today that perhaps some of these purists are not gravitating to the electronic organ because the electronic organ has so many things that you can do and they continue doing different things. And probably this is one of the reasons why these people are thinking, well, this is not a very serious instrument. Mm. Uh, I don't... I think they're missing the point. Again, going back to this conversation, they're missing the point of making music. Mm. It's not the mechanics of the instrument. But let's not embellish the mechanics in such a way that we, because we need to make that organ do what we want. What's wrong with doing what the organ is able to do for you? Mm. I think I understand what you mean.
In 2000, you performed a solo memorial concert in New York City's St. Paul the Apostle as a tribute to one of your heroes and role models, organist Virgil Fox. And you played another Virgil Fox memorial concert at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco in 2004. If you don't mind, what did you most admire about Virgil Fox? He, he brought certain things out of the music that made a lot of people stand up and notice. He did it from a musical point of view. He did it with the full convictions that in his own honesty. And it's interesting because he's, he's also one of the most theatrical yeah. organists. And, and he really popularized yeah. the organ in, in popular culture in many ways, yeah. too. He took Fugel a jig and, uh, you know, he would dazzle everybody the way he played. He would play uh, something that, uh, a chorale by Bach, uh, loaded with the skull strings and the three celestes and the vax humana with tremulans. Uh, he will make the organ sound far more romantic than Bach ever required to. Would Bach play it that way? We don't know. I will not say no. I will not say yes. There are some people who maintain, oh, Bach would have used all those things. I don't know. I don't know if he would have used all of those elements or he would have criticized it. Look, let's face it, Bach didn't think too much of the pianoforte. That's true. That's when they, true. when yeah. Silverman showed it to him. That's right. Yeah. So we have right there an, 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 a specific example that maybe some of this stuff going on today was not appeal, Bach, the yeah. electronic organ and all of that stuff, you know. But Virgil Fox did it and did it from a musical sense, point of view. He was truly... He, uh, in rupture with the music, he sincerely, in his honestly, believed that that's the way that piece should be played. And I embrace what he did and brought the masses to hear an organ concert. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah. Are, are there any other organists that you look up to that you that you admire? Some of the French organists, I don't want to drop names in here, but some of the French instruments. I am very much into French organ, French literature, ah. uh, French organ making, and French organ organists and the way they play. Uh, don't want to drop names right now, but I could probably mention Olivier Latrie in Notre Dame Cathedral or, 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 or Daniel Roth in, in saint Sulpice. A piano person in my year. The, the, the list goes on and on, and some then already passed away, like Marie Claire Lane and, and so forth. But I just, if, uh, there is a concept again, and this is kind of not only erroneous, but silly, that uh, French people can't play Bach because the organ cannot play Bach. Uh, do we really have to play Bach in a specific organ, and that's it? That's, uh, to me, that's a little bit ridiculous. Mm. Again, we're missing the point of what can we do with a French organ to play Bach. There are people who maintain that the French organ is not really very good when it comes to accompanying a church service. What do they do in France? Do they throw all those organs away? Because those churches are packed in Notre Dame and in saint sulpice and they are accompanying a church service with a French organ. So there are certain things that uh, are really misconception from people who don't take the time to study and, and found their, uh, how do you say, opinion yeah. uh, in a documented way. And so, yeah, it, all of these organists, uh, especially in France, as I say, yeah, um, it, it's not just France, Germany. I have always, one of my idols uh, was Karl Richter. Mm. Karl Richter was in Buenos Aires and I heard him playing the Pasacaglia and Fugue. I never forgot. I was nine years old and I never forgot him. I have now seen him in YouTube and some of the old recordings that he did and I treasure that to hear Carl Richter and the way he played. And let me tell you, Carl Richter also went against the grain with a lot of people that say, ah, oh, that's not what you do with Bach. Yet he went down to history as being one of the most foremost uh, experts on the literatures of Johann Sebastian Bach. So, mm. Who are we to judge, you know? It seems that it's so interesting that people or artists who are the most creative get criticized so much in the beginning. And it takes sometimes time 
yes. for people to recognize how outside of the box they were at their time, and then of course their genius gets recognized. But later. but if I may ask a but, to think outside the box in a musical way with the convictions, with and that is the way you want to do it, not just because it's a commercial way, uh -huh. or not just because I am going to turn this whole book upside down and they're going to like it. Mm. Uh, I have a problem with that. Mm. But if you show me that sideways that book can still be read and you can still get the element of what the book is all about it and what the story or what you're reading, and then I'll buy it. I don't know if... I, I completely concur. I think yeah. that's a wonderful way of looking at it. Hector, it's been so lovely just sharing musical ideas and hearing your life story. And I hope you don't mind. I want to end with a fun question. <laughs> oh, I wonder, <laughs> a, a little bluebird told me that you have a very interesting passion. Do you want to tell me what that is? Oh, my God. <laughs> And this is going to be heard all over the world. Yes, it will be. <laughs> well, you know, my wife even is embarrassed when I talk oh. about this. That I have a passion for the WWE. And this is the world wide. What is it? This is the world wrestling. World wrestling. Yes. Okay. Entertainment. Entertainment. This is okay. So this is the wrestling things that you see on TV. These are the yeah. Yeah. Okay. and all of those. Uh, you know, and just like. Just like the passion for meeting Daniel Roth is the passion for meeting John Cena. And if you are not into that, you wouldn't even know who John Cena is. But, I have no idea. But, <laughs> but he's okay. A very famous wrestler. Okay. And, uh, and, and what they do uh, for kids and children, which I also try to do myself in the music by taking kindergarten, first, second grades, and, and playing Johann Sebastian Bach for that. And they have this theatrical and all of the things that they do because it's entertainment. Yes. But they go and make a wish foundation yeah. and to make a little kid that wants to meet one of those wrestlers. So the, the involvement with that, I just, yes, on Monday night, I will be, if possible, glued to my TV to watch WWE. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, there's, there's a wonderful story you told me at lunch about one concert, <laughs> wasn't, there, wasn't there a concert that you played, you, right. you couldn't wait to get to that's the end right. of it, why, why, why was oh, that? Oh, this is so silly, but it's the truth, <laughs> it was in 1966, I was playing a concert in San John the Divine, and I had tickets to go and see Bruno San Martino at Madison Square Garden, and I couldn't wait until the concert was over, and I played my last note, get a lot of the church, take the subway to go to Madison Square Garden, because I had tickets to see Bruno San Martino wrestling. <laughs> Oh I'm embarrassed even to tell oh, the story. Oh, you, you know, but you have such passion for enjoying what you enjoy, whether it's no matter what organ you're working on or whether it's a great fight on TV. Why not? <laughs> Why not indeed? Hector, thank you so much for being very, on very this welcome. show. It's such a delight to meet you, and I, I look forward to hearing more about you. The pleasure is all mine, and thank you for asking all the questions and having this kind of conversation. For links to Hector's website, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. And remember, this Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will be co-hosting a free webinar with Jason Heath on winning the audition. Go to amusicallife.com forward slash audition to reserve your spot. Once again, that web address is a musicallife.com forward slash audition. If you enjoy these stories about all things musical and the things that move our souls, please tell a friend about this show and consider posting a short review on iTunes at a musicallife.com forward slash review. Thank you for your support. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.